uh, Ammanaya has already mentioned what are the other positions, important positions that K.V. Kamath is holding at present. He was associated with Manipal University for more than a decade. He was the member of the board of management of uh, Manipal University and also he was the finance committee member. I still remember I told this this morning when uh, we had a program in the MIT. He was so busy, you know, he hardly used to find time to come to Manipal to attend the, the finance committee meetings. So he always used to request us to come to ICICI Bank, his head of his administrative office in Mumbai, you know, which is an outstanding building, you know. And then he used to host the finance committee meeting, giving us some South Kendra food. I said, Kane, Gassi, and other South Kendra dishes he used to have. I can never forget that. And he used to host these meetings in the boardroom. And later in 2009, he said, I want to take a break. I told him this morning, I want to take a break for a short time as member of the board. And I asked him, what is the time frame? How long you want to take a break? He never mentioned the time. This morning again, I asked him. He said, I will consider. I'm a little busy with some of the government undertakings. Once those responsibilities are over, he said he will come back to Manipal University. We are eagerly awaiting that because I said we miss him in Manipal Board of Management. This morning, Kamath said, when he was addressing the students, my dear students, he said, there could not have been a better time to be born in India than now. So you are all very, very lucky, unlike us, you know. Though, 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 you know, the moral degradation, you heard about this Delhi rape incident recently, and all these scams, 2G scam, now recently the helicopter scam, and all those things. The other day, somebody was telling me, in spite of... Uh, political interference, bureaucratic interference, our country is still progressing. But they said it's only progressing in the night. Then I asked him why, why it is progressing in the, not during, that is because government sleeps during night time. So <laughs> that is the reason and one of the stalwarts who is responsible for all this is K.V. Kamath. See, I was told by somebody recently that there are four classes of people in this country today. Number one is, you know, students who are very brilliant, score 98 or almost 100 percent. They get into either medicine or engineering or maybe management like IIM, uh, Ahmedabad or TAPMI. And <laughs> <laughs> and the rest of the people who get about 95 percent or so become managers, MBAs in a lesser reputed the management school and also they become IAS or IPS. And these are the people who become secretaries and other uh, CEOs, and they control the first group. And the third group hardly pass or some of them fail, they become politicians. <laughs> and these people control the first two groups, isn't it? The dog professionals as well as the, the managers. And the last group who do not do anything, failures, failure, failure, they become underworld dons and they control all these three groups. <laughs> So that is the state of affairs, but you need not dishearten yourself because Kamath will tell you how you should conduct yourself and make our country a developed country in the very, very near future because you are very important for us, you know. It is our responsibility as elders to mold you so that you become good citizens so that we will have a better country to live. So it is but apt, my dear friends, that trustees of KK Pai Trust have decided to honor Sri K.V. Kamath with KK Pai National Award for his outstanding service in the banking sector. We all feel proud that we are having the privilege to honor such an eminent banker today who, was, who has carved out a niche for himself to attract national and international attention. Sri Kamath is a multifaceted personality. Apart from being a great banker, he is an excellent organizer an able administrator, an outstanding orator, about which you will have the proof very shortly, a great thinker, and above all, ladies and gentlemen, he is a very good human being. We heartily felicitate him for his achievements, which should serve as an inspiration to you, my dear younger generation of our country. Thank you very much. So I felicitate Sri K. V. Kamath on behalf of all of us. Thank you.
no a special announcement by dr ramdas empai friends i am pleased to announce that this block will be named after the memory of uh, late sri k k pai and this is the south block and i have the permission of my trustees to say this and uh, the other uh, north block will be named after the founder of manipal late dr t m pai now the most important item reply to the felicitations by shri k v kamath k k p national award good evening thank you i'll i'll, I'll leave it i'm going to keep the water so uh, <laughs> so you can gauge how long i'm going to speak <laughs> don't be frightened we'll finish on time mr satish bhai uh, mr ramdas bhai or uh, as i should correctly call them uh, satish mom and ramdas mom um, chancellor uh, dr balal uh, mr urpa mr tamanaya all my uh, friends uh, from uh, the the pai family here the ladies here dignitaries uh, staff students uh, firstly let me uh, thank uh, the trust for uh, bestowing this honor upon me uh, i am uh, delighted to accept it on uh, my behalf and on behalf of uh, all my colleagues at icsa bank uh, who have made it possible for me to uh, achieved whatever little we did in the bank over the last uh, 15 17 years um, 15 17 years depending on how you want to look at it because earlier on it was i said so limited then it was the bank uh, and that's i think their effort which really has uh, made it possible to uh, have achieved whatever whatever little we did and indeed there is a lot more to do and i'll share that with you as i go along but before i do that i think uh, i need to uh, acknowledge the contribution to the banking industry by uh, both uh, dr t m pai uh, the founder of uh, syndicate bank i would think the founder of what i'd call a new era in banking uh, and uh, later on the baton uh, carried so very well by uh, dr t mr t a pai and later on by mr k k pai i think uh, this is what uh, you know built modern banking and uh, that was the foundation on which you know we used to look up to and uh, we took inspiration from from and then as we saw opportunity in terms of technology which allowed you to do things uh, you leverage technology to uh, try to see whether you could do uh, things uh, differently well i must uh, i think mr balal has uh, indicated that i spent 10 years on the board of uh, uh, the governing council of the university here it was a, a very uh, interesting and learning experience and uh, it was a learning experience for me because anything that i get engaged in i try to see what is it i can learn so i take something away and then give back uh, to the same institution and i i'm sure if all of you can do that keep your minds open to learn throughout your careers and try to give back at every opportunity i think uh, you will achieve great things um, here you know clearly what we saw is uh, how do universities run i came to learn learn that how do good universities run i came to learn that and more importantly in terms of giving we said that this university has to build scale and i think uh, we had visionaries here who thought that that was the right strategy to adopt and i was just saying that in the span of uh, the five years that i have not been in manipal um, you know it's breathtaking if i remember the engineering school had less than 600 or 700 students at that point of time intake every year and we are now running at 2000 and if i am not mistaken it was in the, no, five years back that we set the target that we should aim at 2000 and indeed five years later 2000 has happened it's not a magic number to wave a wand and make uh, it happen you have to build the campus you have to get the infrastructure in the teaching staff in all that was made possible in this period of time so this campus i think uh, is uh, something that uh, we all need to look forward to as a can do uh, epitomizing can do the can do spirit of uh, india the emerging india as we uh, go along so uh, i'm delighted to uh, be back here in manipal uh, after a span of 5 years and uh, to humbly receive uh, this recognition that is bestowed upon me today 
Before I go ahead, uh, you know, I was uh, just glancing through this uh, booklet, and uh, which is a collection of the speeches of various past recipients. And uh, it was indeed uh, I think delightful to go through Mr. Wagul's uh, speech, which I very quickly went through. Um, the major part of the booklet is Mr. Wagul's speech. That's 18 pages. And that's extempore, entirely extempore, because he says in that uh, very interesting anecdote, referring to Mr. Amunaya, so he says, uh, he got the invitation, and he asked his secretary the day he was taking the flight, am I supposed to speak? So she comes back after half an hour and says, I don't think so, sir, you're not supposed to speak. So he asks her, why do you think that I'm not supposed to speak? Because the letter doesn't ask you to speak. <laughs> so, so he says, uh, well, you know, I don't know whether I'm supposed to speak, but... Uh, of course, he is very candid and says that in any case, I would not have prepared. And that is the truth. He never, ever, never, ever prepared for a speech. He never, ever prepared for a presentation. He always spoke extempore. And he could speak to a, a very well-behaved uh, you know, group of students like you are here or to a very unruly uh, uh, group of students, uh, you know, people who have been with him at unruly group of, uh, uh, in front of unruly group of students, I have explained this to him how we could uh, capture their imagination and mesmerize them for whatever period of time he wanted to speak, not they wanted to speak. So, so 18 pages was nothing for Mr. Wagul, but I'm not going to take all that time, but I'll take my allotted time so that we'll finish on time at um, 5.40 as uh, you know, my secretary. Is my secretary is different from Mr. Wagul's secretary. I didn't see, and I was searching, is there a minute-by-minute -minute program here? Because uh, I looked at my uh, you know, PDA and I find there's a minute-to-minute -minute program. You know, it says 405 escort to the dais, 406 do this. So everything down to the fraction of the minute was there. So I'm not going to uh, follow that, but we will finish on time. That's what uh, I think we should do. But before I do that, there are some interesting things that uh, come out from Mr. Wagul's speech. And I had not seen this speech uh, earlier. I think one is he talked about a crisis in 2002, a crisis of uh, non-performing assets. And if any of you interested in banking today looks at papers, that's what the media wants to talk about, a crisis, an impending crisis in the banking business because of rising NPAs. But I can tell you uh, that in 2002, when Mr. Wagul was worried about this, the restructured assets and the non-performing assets of most banking institutions and the, you know, the term lending institutions like ICS Limited were probably upwards of 15% or 20%. Today, it's nowhere in that region. I think restructured assets and uh, non-performing assets, by and large, are less than 5% across the system. So there is no crisis today as there was a crisis in 2002. He was right to fear there would be, would be a crisis at that point. Today, I don't think there is an NPA crisis. And I'm sure our media friends uh, will uh, make a note of that. that I, I would prophesy that there is no crisis. Even the crisis that he thought of in 2002, did not happen because things changed. The economy suddenly took a turn for the good, which I'll talk about briefly within my allotted time a little later. But uh, no, there was no crisis that uh, crept on us and created a problem for us. I think there is something else which is very, very prescient in what he spoke 11 years back. He spoke of what today is being talked of as inclusive banking. And I was startled to see that because we were doing very early efforts in that uh, in terms of how do we take banking to the mass. The mass, as we defined, was the 700 million people in India who are unbanked. So the challenge was, how do you bank the unbanked? 700 million people, how do you go to the village, how do you open an account, and so on. And he says, the, you will see branchless banking. You will see agents of the bank sitting there and acting on your behalf as a branch correspondent. He describes ATMs. He describes a lot of things which in those days were not visible at all. And today, 11 years later, we are rolling out in large numbers. Thanks partly to what Aadhaar did in terms of giving an identity to people. And thanks also to banks uh, being able to take uh, banking in, uh, in, in a mass way at very low cost. And the regulator allowing uh, you know, third parties to be your bank uh, agents. So all that uh, talked of 11 years back in a prescient way to say this is the next step in banking coming true today. One more point, and then I will uh, move on to uh, my speech, not Mr. Wagul's speech, but I think it's important. He talks of uh, the youth uh, leading uh, the future, and he says that his generation of bankers was 50, 
and as he travels through banking, we saw it come down to 40, and he said, I believe now with Mr. Kamat coming there, we're talking of 30, because he's talking of a 30-year-old uh, organization. And indeed, at ICICI Bank, we are just below 30 in terms of our average age. And uh, at Infosys, we are younger. We are probably 28 in our average age. So a younger set of uh, people driving the economy, driving various parts of the economy and so on. And he had uh, looked at these uh, you know, three or four trends well ahead of time, completely out of skelter with what was conventional thought in those days. And the last thing he points about is leadership and succession. And uh, he mentions uh, you know, his having brought me in and what is his role thereafter. A huge amount of wisdom in his speech. So I would recommend to anybody uh, here who is a, a student of management and student of thought to particularly see uh, the speeches in this booklet and uh, uh, certainly do see uh, Mr. Wagul's uh, speech. Because to me, it is uh, education on the go. It is free. And in uh, 10 minutes, you would have educated yourself uh, to an extent that several classrooms uh, will probably uh, find it difficult to uh, do. And taking his guidance forward, uh, that's what I did uh, you know, as I headed into 2009. We started a process of uh, planning for the future, figuring out our leadership, getting that leadership cone as it were right. And ultimately, well before 2009, I stepped down in end of April 2009. We were um, able to make the announcement probably in the middle of uh, 2008 at around, uh, I would think, uh, probably June or uh, so 2008 or July 2008. We announced uh, the successor with enough time to uh, step in, as it were. So there are very interesting stories here. I endorse all those as uh, things that we need to understand, learn as we go into the future. Uh, moving on now to uh, a little bit of uh, you know what we were able to do with technology. Mr. Amanaya described uh, you know, the changes that we brought about, particularly in uh, the context of uh, uh, technology banking, universal banking, and so on. Uh, again, I will treat it more as a management lesson than as uh, sharing the story. Um, you know, it's a th it's a story of constraints, and I would uh, like you to all remember this: that constraint is always good. If you have a constraint, I believe you jump higher. So you need constraints in anything that you do, whether it's in life or in business, your workplace, and you will achieve something more if that constraint exists. So ours was a theory of constraint, and how do you overcome? Uh, constraints. And let me explain. In 2002, uh, well, just before 2002, ICICI Bank, uh, just about, um, you know, I would say 70 or 80 branches, uh, maybe um, 700 people or so, and a huge uh, challenge in terms of willingness to adopt technology. So what I presented to them was very simple. I said, look, if we are now to go the organic way, the Reserve Bank will allow us 25 branches a, a year, 25 branches a year. And it will take us, you can work out how many hundred years, multiple of hundred years, to reach the 10,000 branches the State Bank of India has got. But we believe that there is no constraint in setting up ATMs. Everybody turned around and said, there are 100 ATMs in the country. I said, let us go and set up 1,000 ATMs in year one. That it's impossible. I said, the word impossible doesn't exist. Making it possible is something that we need to challenge. So. Long story short, the period of one year, we rolled out 1,000 ATMs. To me, that was the start of, uh, the, uh, the, I would say, the technology revolution in this country. It was not because uh, we dreamt big and we did uh, things, but very simply, we did not have the branches. We wanted to create the reach, and we believed technology would provide the reach. Then we said, the ATM is not, not enough. You need the call center. So you put a 2,000 seat call center. We said, that's not enough. We need to make sure the customer can access on the internet. So we rolled out the internet. Just let me give you a snapshot. 2002, I look back at our numbers, 94% of transactions in ICICI Bank took place through a bank branch. That is, the customer came in into the branch for any simple thing. He came into the bank to ask simple question, what's my bank balance? He came, a commercial customer, a small commercial customer would said, send somebody you know, his clerk or somebody, four times into the bank branch to ask a simple question, there's a check which I have credited, has that been passed? To ask that question four times, that somebody would come in. So 94% of transactions in the bank took place in your branch. And, of course, the rest of it, you can say through the 100 ATMs that are there and so on. Today, if I look at it, we have 
15% of the transactions taking place through the branch, 1-5, 15%. And the rest of them take through technology channels. So every customer of ours either uses the ATM, uses a call center, or is, uses most often his PDA to do things and uh, to transact things. So a sea change in terms of how uh, the customer has looked at it. And two or three things have happened in parallel. One, technology has kept pace. So you have a situation where technological evolution, technological developments have kept pace with whatever you wanted to do so that you could serve your customer at lower and lower costs and you can serve the customer significantly more efficiently. So efficiency and, efficiency and cost both became possible by introduction of uh, technology into banking. And indeed, uh, rightly so, as uh, the government opened up the financial services space, banks could get into other products, particularly insurance, mutual funds, and uh, you know, share uh, the opportunity to uh, invest in these products or partake of these products to its own customer base. And that opened up a whole new uh, window, as it were, to, uh, to banking in, over the last uh, 10 years or uh, so. We move on then to uh, uh, the inclusive bit that I said uh, Mr. Wagul talked about in 2002 and what is happening uh, today. And I find it uh, fascinating. Um, it is just two or three years since uh, the Reserve Bank allowed banks to open, uh, an account, to open a branch using somebody who is not an employee, some third party or an agent in a village. And that's how you can reach out to 600,000 villages in 600 districts across India. Because otherwise, if you use your own branches, it's too expensive to actually serve your customer. So you have to figure out a way to serve the customer at the lowest possible cost uh, in a way that uh, you can take technology there and the customer is served. And within that, uh, and doing, doing that, what you find is the advantages today of uh, the cost of hardware going down. You know, handheld devices, you all know what has happened to the cost. Connectivity reaching to almost 400 or 450,000 uh, uh, villages across India. And similarly, uh, the cost of connectivity dropping dramatically. You all, think, I'm sure everyone here uses a phone with, uh, with a 3G connection, uh, connecting to the internet. This cost coming down has changed the paradigm as far as uh, banking is concerned. And I think today, it is not just an ICICI bank, but the entire banking community has seized this opportunity. And I clearly find that uh, the government has supported it, the Reserve Bank has supported it, and uh, I think the dream that we had maybe 10 years back that we could do inclusive banking to bring the 700 million people, unbanked customers into the fold, I think is now within, uh, within I would think, achievable distance because of all these things that have uh, happened. My own view is that technological change continues, so we need to look at what is in front of us tomorrow. And uh, clearly there I see uh, two uh, major uh, trend shifts that have taken place. I won't talk about them in detail. I talked about them in detail in the morning. But suffice to say, the first was in 1980, when, uh, with the advent of the PC, uh, several programs which otherwise would need to be written by an IT department, a programmer who worked for an IT department, you could actually deal with those programs yourselves. Most of uh, the young people here look at them as uh, the spreadsheet, which came into being around that point in time, whether it was SuperCalc, QuizzyCalc, names not heard of today because all of you know only of the Excel spreadsheet, and or uh, typing programs like WordPerfect. Again, none of you have heard of it because you have heard only of Word. And similarly, database uh, management tools and so on. But available on uh, very simple, unsophisticated machines by today's standards, but you could do a whole lot of things at that point of time using these technologies. And interestingly, these technologies you could operate yourself. So a layman could talk to the computer, and I always say at that point of time, and this I'll paraphrase because it's an inter interesting way to paraphrase. I used to think that the computer is God, and to talk to God you needed a set of priests, and those priests were the IT department. And only they gave you access to God. You could not talk to God directly. But the advent of the spreadsheet, the advent of typing programs, database management tools allowed you to directly communicate with God. This was 1981. Since then, a lot of progress has happened. But today, I think the next inflection point is clearly happening. And all of you, uh, particularly the younger uh, generation, are going to be right into it. 
That is the whole space which so far we have called the cloud space. But if you really want to know, I don't think there's any cloud space anymore. We are all in the cloud. Willy-nilly, the device that you got in your pocket is operating in a cloud environment, quote-unquote, the so-called cloud environment. So you're already into it. So uh, we, I don't think, need to label it as something special. Similarly, today you are into the app world where you can, you have several degrees of freedom which we did not have earlier. And in terms of technology, as a result, what you find is the ability to use technology is moving away from the office of the CTO to the office of the chief marketing officer or whoever is the business head of a division, unit or whatever. So that migration in terms of uh, computing you know, strength and uh, who ownership, I think has already shifted. And you're all seeing that in the West where uh, the budgets of a CTO today are less than the budget of a CMO or a, a business unit head. So that shift has already happened and that's something that all of us will have to look at, learn, understand as we get into business because that's the new reality of the future. And of course, in a banking context, it has huge implications. The way you deal uh, with your customer now will not be dependent on what your CTO tells you, could be done or not done on a technological context, but your own frontline people, uh, what sort of databases they maintain, how do they actually run those databases, how do you build your business intelligence, all these will move and become front-end functions rather than functions done in the background by some, somebody else. So I guess that uh, a whole lot of change is happening in this space, which uh, we will see uh, being put to good use as we go along. And all this in a context where costs are dropping dramatically, Moore's law is alive and well for those of you who are engineers, and I interacted with a small set of uh, your classmates, and they told me that 80% of you are engineers, so uh, all of you would know what's Moore's law. Um, and if we just want to remind ourselves, that's where we say that the power of computing is growing at a square every two years, the costs are dropping in proportion. So you will get devices which are more and more powerful at lower and lower, lower, and lower costs, and that's the environment in the life that you will uh, live in. And uh, I heard uh, Dr. Balal say that, uh, you know, I, the earlier, my earlier talk I had said uh, there's been never a better time to have been born an Indian. I meant it, and uh, to this group also let me explain why I meant it. And to uh, explain that I need to get into um, the territory of Indian economics for maybe uh, two or three minutes so that we still are on time to finish the function as scheduled. Uh, if you look at the Indian story, it took us 25 years, and this is again um, not written up in the media. It took us 25 years to increase our per capita income from $250 to $500, and it took uh, that was in the year 2004. So from 1979 to 2004, 25 years to take our per capita income from $250 to $500. How many years do you think it took us thereafter to double it from $500 to $1,000? It took us four years. So 25 years for 250 to 500, four years from 500 to 1,000. And then after 1,000 to 1,600 and odd, now it has taken us just about four years or less than four years. So clearly there is accelerated economic development that is happening. And all of you are a part of that. And all of you are actually, you know, you know I would say benefiting from this sort of accelerated development that is happening around us uh, in terms of the country's ability to do projects, its ability to throw up surpluses and generate opportunities as we go along. And uh, as a result, uh, we sometimes you know, do not acknowledge the sort of challenges that the previous generations would have had to go through to achieve what they did. And that's why it took that generation 25 years to double its per capita income, whereas in your case, you'll probably end up doing that in three, four year span. And uh, get on to a level, if it is $1,600 today, I believe in the next six to seven years, we are looking at per capita incomes in the region of three and a half to $4,000. How do I translate it in, simpler, in a simpler way? We are at this point in time, seven to eight years behind China. We are not in a race. I'm using this as a benchmark to tell us where we are because China is visible to us. India is not visible. So if, you, if I want to easily paint an India of tomorrow, I can say that if you look at China today, you can assume that you will be there in terms of India getting there seven years from now. That's all I'm trying to say. Let's not get into a race with China. And I see clearly, I see it clearly happening. And I've gone back and benchmarked every three years where were we and uh, you know how have we shaped up. 
I think we keep up at that pace. And to me, that is good enough. Trying to grow faster than that probably has challenges. As a, a sideline, we always say that, uh, you know, we look at the media, we look at reports, uh, we sometimes get worried. Are we off in the growth path? Is growth slowed down? Are we going to face challenges? Again, wherever I've seen, if you look at last 60 years, growth stories, when countries grow, when they grow particularly out of poverty, uh, out of a developing country status to a developed country status, once you set it in motion or it sets itself in motion, growth continues for about 25 years. Growth stops uh, when two things happen. You become uncompetitive primarily. Uncompetitive in terms of wages and you get uncompetitive in terms of exchange rates. Then growth stalls. Look at, look at Japan. Growth momentum from 1950 to almost 1990. Uh, you look at the exchange rate. In uh, the 50s, it was 350 to 360 yen to the dollar. By the time growth started slowing down and China went in, uh, Japan went into negative territory, growth had, uh, the exchange rate had gone to less than 100 uh, yen to the dollar. So that strengthening of uh, the yen, you know, meant that you lost your competitiveness as you go along. And then you can see the stories of the tiger economies, Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, et al., then Southeast Asia, then China, and of course now it's our turn. So it's long run growth. So uh, growth coming down from eight and a half, nine percent to currently, uh, you know, some say five, some say six. Now, let's say it is six percent. I think these are all temporary uh, blips that will happen, but we will get back on to uh, the growth path, which should, uh, you know, then you know provide for uh, the sort of GDP growth that I said, because that growth is required if we are to truly transform ourselves. I believe that transformation will happen. The technological transformation is happening for a certainty. And our ability to get that technological transformation is happening for a, a certainty, inclusive uh, development. I think there are serious efforts, and I hope these efforts bear fruit. The government has set a direction.